Good afternoon and welcome to the latest uh, event in the Festival, York Festival of Ideas. Um, the, uh, we, we're here today to talk to, sorry, my name is Nick Hex. Um, I'm uh, I, uh, a health economist. I work for York Health Economics Consortium at the University of York. Um, but we're here today to talk to Pope Lonergan, um, who is going to talk to us about his um, fantastic new book, um, I'll Die After Bingo, um, which is an intimate view of what life is like in a care home, uh, with, shown with humour and compassion um, for both residents and carers. Um, Pope is a stand-up comedian, amongst other things. He's also a Quaker and a recovering drug addict. He's also a care assistant, and for the next 40 minutes or so, he's going to tell us about his life in uh, working in a care home for the last nine and a half years or so. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Pope and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Nick, and hello to all you people out there. Uh, uh, we was going to do this in person, but um, a few different things didn't line up in our favour, you know, railways at the moment and uh, the weather and etc etc so we thought we'd do it online and I'm happy to be here talking to all of you so I am Pope Lonigan. this will be my introduction probably to a, to, to a lot of you um, and I'll read directly from the book at certain points uh, so to, just in order to describe the book um, I've been variously described as captivating nauseating a um, bit unfair, that one. Uh, rambunctious, gloriously horrid and heart-stoppingly raw. I'm an Essex desperate, cheeky yet in pain. A comedian who also does care work, a care worker who also does comedy, addicted to drugs, books and anything else that gives me a temporary release. And the people I'm working with, the people I'm caring for are just as multifaceted and many dimensioned as me and the rest of us. And some of the main themes that I explore within the book um, and come under the rubric of care work, and as an individual that's exempt from the social milieu of the uh, professional class, the professional class the, are people who won't let me come to their dinner parties, even if I promise to bring wine and pay them. But the themes go are uh, things such as gendered work or caring being perceived as innately feminine, personhood, dignity in old age, profit maximisation in the social care sector, the physical toll of the job, the mental toll of the job, ageing and death, humour as a coping mechanism, what makes a good carer and being an outsider, um, addicts and elderly people both in their own ways, uh, marginalised by society. And also the balance between cruelty and kindness. So I don't want to pretend that this I'll Die After Bingo is in any way a comprehensive or definitive account of the complex relationships and competing needs you'll find in more forensic studies of care work. There are plenty of them out there, uh, which makes the lack of public attention towards the profession even more dumbfounding. Uh, I've got a pile of them here. Labours of Love is a brilliant one. I highly recommend that by uh, Madeline Bunting. And there's another one called The Care Crisis, but the name of the author slips mind. Write that in, The Care Crisis. Two brilliant books there for you. Instead, this book, my book, is a hyper-individualistic and personal account. Erratic, digressionary, crass, humane, and hopefully a little bit funny and a little bit wise. It's an entire book of me standing here or within the context of the book or at work uh, and banging on until you are sick to bloody death of me. Uh, <laughs> I've got one of those voices. It's a bit, I've got the typical Essex accent as well, but I've got one of those voices that slightly kind of is filtered through the nose, I think. So it's a kind of blobby, weird voice. And one of my fellow comedians, uh, once said about me that I am someone who's intelligent but sounds thick, uh, which is a good uh, a good summation of of me and my personality. So yeah, writing the book, I'll tell you about how that came to be. I was really lucky in that uh, I was getting a bit of press attention um, as a comedian and a comedian who talks about and does shows about addiction, such as my show Pope's Addiction Clinic, which is 
it's almost like uh, an, an AA meeting, but you know, at, at, within a show format. But it's uh, comedians will be hyper confessional, and uh, will sort of uh, chuck up the the most private aspects of their life for the uh, audience's viewing and listening pleasure. And then the care home tour, which I'll talk about um, a, a bit later on. I'll have, have a few photos to show you of that a bit later on. And um, so, and, and, and Zara, uh, from who's with Ebury Penguin at the time, have been a brilliant team. I've loved every single person I've worked with over the course of this doing this book. And it was my first foray into publishing as well and being like a, someone from a working class background and that and uh, a bit of an isolate in a lot of ways and sort of someone who isn't a big social butterfly. I have my small core uh, group of friends who I've known since I was born. I don't really have those connections, you know, so it was all brand new to me. And uh, Zara noticed an article that was written about me and about some of the, the the elderly care stuff that we've been doing and just asked me if I'd be willing to write a proposal, a book proposal for a funny, you know, funny such tragic memoir um, about elderly care and having worked in it for so long, like nearly a decade. Uh, and I think there's also, I'll get on saying a bit anyway, by the way, when I said in the book, erratic digressionary that also uh, applies to my way of speaking so i apologize <laughs> there'll be a lot of uh, moments where it'll be quite tangential i'll go off and you think we're going to come to some, some sort of resolution um but a bit of a shaggy dog way of uh, explaining things and talking about life and i always like the, the the shaggy dog format but um yeah asked me to she asked me to write a book proposal I stupidly put it off like for a long time um, until for about a year and a bit until the pandemic absolutely decimated live comedy and, and live entertainment full stop. And a lot of many other uh, areas it decimated everything for a long while, didn't it? But because of that time, I, uh, I was able, I was put in a position where I could devote my time and actually really focus on this book proposal and luckily they loved it it was unanimous they wanted to uh they wanted to take it on board and then uh and and then uh, this popped out i mean it really is i say it, it it sounds trite to say it was a group effort but without my excellent editors uh it would just be the mad ramblings of uh <laughs> of a, a, a Quaker, a crackhead Quaker, <laughs> writing in a Word document at three in the morning. Um, but uh, so, yeah, they really helped me to kind of, uh, you know, to, to turn it into, to turn it into a, a coherent, coherent narrative, um, which is great. I mean, I, I've, I've loved the writing process, but it still retains, you know, my voice. They, they didn't, they, we were always on the same page and we were always uh, committed to, you know, showcasing my voice and my worldview and the environment I worked in and being faithful to that as well. So that was great. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll I'll first of all uh, maybe talk a little tiny bit about my childhood. I, I do touch upon it briefly. I was, uh, I, I was a bit of, I still call myself a kind of apocalypticist I, I have a tendency to catastrophize and even though I was a happy kid I was quite shy and plagued by insecurity and mum often had to collect me from primary school for various reasons um, like the time one of my classmates tipped me off that Saddam Hussein's um, imminent nuclear attack was uh, gonna ruin my school uh, <laughs> or when I was disturbed by tales of a, a clitoris tree courtesy of a premature, prematurely sexualized nine-year-old called Greg, who'd obviously sourced some of the correct information about sexuality uh, and in his in innocence recontextualized it, hence the clitoris tree. A key thing I do remember from my childhood was my parents stressing to me the sanctity of all living things. 
From them, I'd like to think that I have acquired the necessary quality of any good carer, the capacity to provide care and tenderness, at least some of the time. For the majority of her career, mum has worked as an auxiliary nurse. And while I was in primary school, she worked for 10 years as a care assistant to accommodate my and my brother's school schedule. I don't know if I like consciously gravitated towards care to follow my mum's footsteps. Um, she never made it sound particularly appealing. Although looking back, her recollections now are, are a lot more they're a lot more uh, tender and 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 favourable. Like she she would just focus on the connections and the the friendships she made with the residents now, rather than the grind and the the uh, the, the stresses and strains of the work, which again is something I'll get onto shortly. Um, although I knew there were patients that left an indelible mark on her. And for those, her heart still swells when she recalls their struggles. But in a recent chat, she admitted to me she can't remember much about most of the elders she cared for, only vague details like their, the textual remains of antiquity lost to time. And isn't that sad? All those sparks of connection, all those little asides and inside jokes, dead and gone. And my dad was actually a detective who raised a... Uh, a drug addict son. So you mark that one up, Mark. Anyway, you know, he's a good dad. Lovely, 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 lovely dad. Lovely dad, but a tough dad. You know, I suppose dad, fathers and their sons, like my dad is the sort of dad who will watch uh, a, a stand-up clip of me and turn it off after a good 15 seconds and say, uh, I've seen enough. I get the gist. So, but a lovely supportive dad. And I do, uh, I do love him to bits. Uh, so, yeah, when I was younger, mum and dad both had jobs that occasionally pushed them close to the dark extremes of human behaviour. And with my mum more directly, she was working with those who suffered for, uh, with, with dementia and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You, you always try and look for your rosebud or like, you know, what was the root of... The, the occupation you devoted a lot of your time to. I mean, initially it was just a thing of my cousin knew so. And I was in uni, I needed a job, and my cousin knew someone, and I went into it, and um, I did end up, I did end up loving it. You certainly, as a lot of carers would say, you don't go in it for the money because the money is almost non-existent. Um, but uh, sorry, no going into this bit yeah okay but so one of the one of the things i mentioned is the the the, the relationship that developed between you and the residents and i remember reading an essay by simone wow apologies if i've mispronounced the surname um, and she's one of my all-time idols i've got a mixed eclectic bag of idols including the wrestler mick foley Love Mick Foley, someone who can, if you don't remember wrestling, uh, he got thrown off the top of the cage by The Undertaker. And there's that, that brilliant shot where you can see his tooth through his nose. Uh, and he was known for having this hardcore wrestling style that was uh, kind of very bloody and ravaged his body. But despite all of that, he was actually a very gentle soul who loved Christmas and had a Christmas house, uh, a Christmas room in his house all year round Christmas room. So I like I like that contrast. Uh, comedian Andy Kaufman and Hans Taven and uh, philosopher Walter Benjamin and also Simone Well. And she wrote about the powerful energy and agency of our attention. She said attention taken to its highest degree is the same thing as prayer. It presupposes faith and love absolutely unmixed attention is prayer in care work it's so important to abandon the reward cycle a big part of addiction which we'll get onto later the chase for an invigorating upswing and to relinquish your ego as much as possible to direct your attention to the person you're caring for because when i was 
still using. Um, I'd manically traipse up and down corridors in my steel toe gap boots, sweaty and grey, delivering Brexit updates to the people who still thought Harold Wilson was prime minister. But now I'm drug free. I'm open, mentally alert and active. Uh, without giving my colleagues anxiety. But even in those times, it's a weird misconception to think because you're a drug addict. I was, I suppose you call functioning drug addict. And it, it never had a, a detrimental effect on my ability to care for the residents. Uh, it did have a detrimental effect on my ability to turn up for work eventually. Eventually, it, it, it's not sustainable drug addiction. I wouldn't recommend it. So I, whenever I, uh, um, come, I don't know if I mentioned I'm a oh, yeah, I mentioned briefly crackhead Quaker. I, 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 I don't mean to refer to myself in such blunt terms, but I quite, <laughs> I quite like it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I quite ha having the Essex in me, we have a tendency to lean into coarse, uh, <laughs> slightly brutish, slightly rambunctious language and behavior, but. I am very religious. And I always found with Quakerism that it aligns really well with progressive politics. A lot of Quakers seem to be on the right side of history when it comes to like civil rights struggles, etc. You know, during, the, I don't know, I was going to say the antebellum period, but someone will probably correct me. So actually, the antebellum period came after this, but, you know, during uh, chattel slavery. Uh, there was a Quaker network of Quakers who are, are helping the slaves uh, in the Underground Railroad um, escape from the South to the North. Just just things like that. You wait whenever there's kind of a good shift, a good sort of social benevolent social shift. It's always a couple of Quakers knocking about and they're, they're usually involved in that. And also I like the. The sitting in silence, that meditative part of Quakerism because as someone who does like to bang on an awful lot uh, any excuse to, to sit and shut myself up <laughs> uh, kind of the negation of language but to still feel a communality amongst you and the people you're sharing the room with is I, I love that and I love the egalitarian spirit of Quakerism which is you know innate godliness that there isn't anyone who's a more worthy representative of God and God's message. It is a, a shared thing. We all have a slight glint, a sparkle of, uh, spark of godliness within all of us. And that really appealed to me. And, and they don't believe in idolatry. So there's not, you get meetings house, uh, meeting houses, the Quaker meeting houses and friends house and stuff, um, but they don't believe in places like, uh, like buildings that are the, the 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 place where God resides. That, that these buildings are a vessel to God. Quakes don't believe in that. And the upside to that is, it's it, it. You could treat it like a bit of a, a, a lazy bones religion. Like you can, you don't have to even go to the Quaker meeting houses. You could just do at home quaking. <laughs> so uh, no, but it's good to go to the meeting houses because uh, that's where you get the real uh, the real good uh, spiritual connection i find so moving on to institutionalization within care homes by the way the book has got a load of uh, really great lively stories about the residents i cared for because a, a guiding ethos of the book was to make sure the residents weren't just a punchline weren't cheap comic fodder, that they're kind of fully fleshed, layered human beings. I don't know if I've always successfully achieved that, but that I, I, that's what I've, I've tried to ensure that I've done that to the best of my ability. And I did develop really deep, meaningful relationships with the residents. And there's a lot of that in there, but I don't want to spoil, I don't want to uh, read the more vivid accounts because I, I, I want I've got to give you a good incentive to buy the book. Um, so there's loads of that in there. But there's a passage in Eva Feder Kitte, again, might be mispronouncing that, in Love's Labour, Essays on Women, Equality and Dependency. 
uh, where she writes about man managing one's expectations when caring for the elderly. Because I believe she had a, um, a disabled daughter as well. And so a lot of her writing, I mean, she's a theorist and a philosopher. And I mean, she's a real kind of leading voice when it comes to care ethics. Um, but she introduces autobiographical elements and talks about uh, mothering a, a, a child with, with, with a, a dependent child. You know? and she writes about managing one's expectation when caring for the elderly and the caregiver's aim of tarrying the old person's demise. She writes, care for the elderly requires fostering relevant self-sufficiency and self-esteem rather than fostering growth like you would in someone who's a lot younger. Rather than socialising for acceptance, care for the elderly requires stemming a disintegration of that social acceptability and sense of self-esteem, which the individual attained while a vigorous adult. And I actually argue that the burden of change is on, where well, I say, the right side of society. I don't mean right wing, I mean... The, what some people will say is the correct side of society, which I don't, you know, I don't agree with. I don't agree with. Uh, I don't agree with talking about it in those terms. But, or in other words, that we should try to instill a more tolerant attitude when confronted with aberrant behaviour by educating people about the effects of neurodegenerative diseases or other mental disorders. You know, you sometimes see someone when you're out and about and the way they converse, you just intuitively know, you think something's a bit, again, I'm going to say a bit off. I don't mean it in that way. But, um, and so people, you know, they'll manoeuvre around that person. They'll navigate around that person. Whereas I think we need to be educated to understand what, what they're exhibiting. What are these behaviours they're exhibiting? What's the root of it? what mental health disorder have they got, et cetera. So we can do what we can to accommodate these people, include these people and make them feel as much a part of society as anyone else. Um, and we had, you know, we had a, a incredible kind of, we were the envy of the world when it came to our welfare in, infrastructure, going back to the post-war era. And it's just fallen into absolute disrepute and, um, I mean, the the some of the conclusions I come to in the book might be slightly bleak on that in that sense, but we'll get onto that. Or we won't. We maybe we will. Maybe we won't. As I said, I'm quite a tangential person. Sometimes I'll just spiral off, never to revisit that. So, uh, okay, we might as well talk about the care home tour. Uh, I'll just our wonderful tech uh, Michael uh, will show you a series of photos that were taken from the first ever Care Home Tour show. Uh, thank you, Michael. There we go. There's a photo from the first care home to uh, tour show, which was uh, an abject failure. No, it wasn't really. It, was, it had its faults, but because it was a, um, a, a process of learning and changing and adapting. So I'll talk about what we were doing with the care home tour and how we changed from that first ever show to what we're doing now. So in 2017, I co-created the care home tour with comedian Ben Tarjay. Uh, ben as a sort of zen-like Mayan, an embodied patience, and a reflective way of speaking that's naturally soothing. And with his shaved head, 
aqua blue eyes and beak like nose. I think you saw him in them pictures with a little party popper on his head. Plus his mischievousness and predilection for absurdity. It's as if he stepped out of an avant-garde puppet show. A brilliant foil to my rambunctious Essexness. So when we did interviews together to promote the care uh, home tour show, there was always um, <laughs> there's always a good comic contrast in that. I'd talk and talk and talk and talk and talk before I actually had anything to say. And he'd wait in silence for ages. And then when he finally said something, it was very eloquent, very, prof very profound, um, heavy with meaning. <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, that was just quite a nice contrast between us two. Uh, we actually, this is an aside, but the following year, before when we were making the Care Home Tour show, um, the following year, we stayed at an artist residency to work on the logistics of the tour. It was a, a big Georgian building in a Chalkwell Park. Near, I live at a South End boy, born and bred. Chalkwell's fairly near South End. On one of those evenings, I turned up at 11 p.m. after finishing a shift at the care home. So I was still working in the care home, but I was also living in this artist residency. And when I arrived, there was a woman with severe mental illness haunting the doorway. It was cold and wet. I invited her in for a cup of tea and some leftover rice. I offered to walk her to a hostel or to pay for a taxi. Any method of getting her back safely and um, whatever she was comfortable with. But she refused to leave, telling me, this is my house and I'm getting married in the morning. As far as home invasions go, it wasn't terrible. It wasn't terrible. I ended up being trapped in the lobby with her for the rest of the night and she was perched on the bottom step of the staircase and I was sitting on the floor with my feet against the wall and she screamed every time I tried to leave and told me I was made of circuits. She also did loads of impression from Harry Enfield and Chums, which she inaccurately identified as Little Britain and referred to one of the characters as Tim Nice but Shite, which is wrong. It's the wrong name. It's weird how quickly you can become familiar with, with people and forge an unexpected intimacy. This goes back to the care work. Even though I was a semi-hostage, we bickered over film titles and after she threatened to harm herself and had no option but to call the police, as they calmly escorted her out, we high-fived and both said, late as nutbag, which is a, a term of endearment I regularly use that obviously rubbed off on her. And while she was walking away down the long pathway leading to the park's gated entrance, I overheard her say to the police, he's a nice bloke, but I think he's mentally ill. So, <laughs> and I was gutted I never saw her again. She was actually a, a bit of a laugh, but at points quite, quite threatening. Uh, so I got the idea of the care home tour after observing how residents would respond to my prattling about and uh, noticing the lack of diversity in care home entertainment, at least at the places I've worked in. I know there's other homes that really excel at this. There's one in Ben... Benfleet, no, not Benfleet, where the uh, Towie people come from, Brentwood. There's one in Brentwood. That's amazing. I mean, you, you go in the care home and they've got like 14 bagpipers, you know, getting, a, you know, you go, you come out the lift and you've got 14 bagpipers knocking about. You've got a cinema room. They've got racquetball courts. It's, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really something. I realised that the residents who wanted live comedy weren't being catered for. Although intuitively I knew the linguistic ledger domain of a joke or even the narrative momentum of storytelling might be difficult for people with dementia to follow. Depends what type of dementia, of course. It, you know, dementia is a symptom of a pre-existing disease and it can affect all different parts of the brain. You know, like my, my nan, for instance, had a um, frontotemporal dementia, a Pick's disease. And as a result of the Pick's disease, she exhibited quite libidinous behaviour uh, and she was having it off with a lot of the, uh, the, old, the old boys around the home. You know, uh, that was uncomfortable for us, uh, very uncomfortable for us, but um, she, she is an adult, but that is how it affected her brain. It was more personality. It was more personality rather than memory. So she still retained the memories 
but change their personality. Uh, perhaps they struggle to process the internal logic or subversion of such logic with a joke or a story. But during the shift, I'd boot stalls around the room shouting footstool football or pretend to trip up and spill jugs of juice or demonstrate my karate skills, which were obviously purposely rubbish. And I knew some of the residents found this comic business very funny. It had an infectious antic energy and was sometimes met with this kind of uh, big uh, delinquent laughter, which I liked. So when Ben and I were choosing performers, we sought those who were adept at physical and interactive comedy and could create a bit of a spectacle, spectacle something quite interactive and kinetic. But we also wanted to combine the comedy of musical elements and dancing. We wanted the show to be close in spirit to the variety bills of the residents' youth, packed with comics, musicians and speciality acts. For our first few shows, we brought along five other acts to do a 10 minute set each. It was still in its incubation stage and a bit of a shambles. During one of them, I introduced comedian Nathan Lang, whose stuntman act, unbeknownst to us, obviously, ended with a strip tease, which alarmed, right for, rightfully so as well, alarmed the activities coordinator. Um, he wasn't completely naked. He had underwear, flesh coloured underwear that he decorated with quite a, a detailed drawn on penis. And I was sure that was going to force the abrupt termination of the care home tour. And Nathan, who's, I've just got to say, it's a very sweet, blue eyed, innocent. He did this. Uh, he's almost like a Peter Pan type figure. About a week after this occurred though, I had a conversation with one of the residents about the show. I was concerned because she had a history of being abused by men. But she asked me to kneel down and having done so, she whispered in my ear, I especially like the part when the man took all his clothes off. And this was followed with a guarded behind the hand laugh, delighted by her own candour. We shouldn't forget they're grown ups. Um, but obviously, you know, you 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 want to you want to check first. Don't just spring that on people, which unfortunately is what happened in that case. And we weren't expecting it. This wasn't vetted by me or Ben. And when Nathan returned to the corridor to the assembled comedians waiting to go on, I said, well, that's this little project burnt to the ground. We really thought that was it. But then luckily uh, there were parts of these earlier shows that actually redeemed this transgression and dragged the care home tour back from complete dilapidation. Like Adam Rich is persuading a resident to spit out a strawberry into his hand. And this lady had been secretly stealing strawberries that were meant for his show and he sort of pretended to to scold her and she like played along with it like she knew she wasn't really being told off it was it was just part of the joke um and yeah he managed to get her to spit the strawberries back strawberries back in his hand so it's kind of allowing people to be a bit i don't know a bit transgressive and a bit naughty uh and you through trial and error you work out who the people are who you kind of want anyway we'll get we'll get to that who want to be part of the show but i'll talk about that in a sec oh the brilliant helen duff passing around random random postcards and she triggered another resident's reminiscence about milking a cow in her youth or ben as you saw in the photos removing a series of diminishing hats until he revealed a tiny party popper balancing on his head we subsequently progressed to a more inclusive approach, identifying that the main aim of these shows, which soon turned into workshops where three quarters of the attendees happened to have dementia. And we realized that the aim was just to facilitate a conversation or a fruitful interaction with the residents. That's all it was. That's all it was. Those little moments of engagement, you know, you're not gonna get, there's not, going to be a kind of coalescence like you would find in like a comedy club because people different levels of dementia their uh, their attention span is going to be all over the place uh like helen and audrey who talked spoke about the cow there'd be no more performing at residence that was the problem with the first show instead for those who wanted to take part we would perform with them that could mean challenging a group of geriatrics to an arm wrestling match, which was my approach. 
which and they'd always built, beat me and I pretend oh, yeah, I obviously let him beat me but a lot of the time um, I was giving it my all so uh, they're just whatever we're feeding these old geezers it's working or introducing them to a box they could fill with special memories this was quite a, a conceptual approach so he's brought in an empty box so we can fill it with special memories only for the residents to misunderstand uh, the purpose of the box and deposit their loose change and wedding rings into it. So we intended the latter to spark some recollections, but it turned into an inadvertent mugging. <laughs> so, but we blame, blame comedian John Norris for that. It could be as simple as helping someone to speak, encouraging them to participate, or bringing them into the fold of a collective experience. And most important of all, allowing them to respond to this minor spectacle in whichever way they saw fit, as long as it doesn't harm anyone involved. We don't want to force happiness. We don't want to force anything. We only want to initiate fleeting moments of engagement while recognising the tremendous value in such an occurrence for a room full of sputtering minds, including my own sputtering mind. I don't subscribe to the cultural imperative to transform troubling thoughts or illnesses or life stories, life stories into messages of hope. I think let people gripe and moan and vent like a lot of the time when the residents vent their depression, like they're shut down. They're told, oh, it's not all bad. You know, they, 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 they don't, people aren't giving them freedom to talk about what's going on up there and their mood and how they've been affected. But not everything has to be an inspirational plaque. And to me, it's more inclusive to take this approach because you're not socially culling the participants who aren't coherent enough or polite enough or have their trousers on enough to fulfill a narrative of overcoming adversity. The kind you may see in a stage managed documentary about a care home. And that is not what I wanted to do with this book. I wanted it to be unsentimentalized unsanitized account of care home living and the relationships that are forged between the residents and the carers um, and to be a nice balance of brutal black humor but then also you know wonderful tenderness and a delicacy of feeling and uh, I, i've been getting reviewed and the reviews have been amazing like I really was I was so preparing myself and bracing myself for a mixture or um or just negative ones not uh, and they've been a, a, so far across the board uh, really brilliant and lovely and you, you write in isolation for so long you don't know how you're going to be received but I've been received in a way that I was really hoping I'd be received which is uh great because it puts a spotlight on the residents it puts a spotlight on the on care work and the systemic failings and fault lines of care work and for someone like me who's always felt kind of out of step with society which is why i sought friendships in care homes in the hot box of a care home with people with slightly broken brains uh, i felt more at home with them than the rest of my peers but to have people read the book and say yeah no do you know what we like you we like the book you know it's great good good job laddie buck that's been very nice. So, uh, <laughs> um, so buy it, buy it, and uh, that's the end of my uh, my babbling on for a little bit. And um, we're going to come to questions, I believe. And uh, I think Nick even has a question, so I, I look forward to answering them. Fantastic, thank you, Pope. That's that's been brilliant, and um, I think it really echoes. I mean, I've I've been reading your book in the last week or so. And I would, yeah, I'd echo exactly what you were just saying by it. Um, I mean, I think exactly how you describe it. Um, it is digressionary, it's disruptive, but it's really honest, but it's also very intimate. And I think very tender in certain places. I mean, I know you don't want to give too much away because you won't be able to buy it and read it, but there's a particular passage where you talk about um, washing a woman and how yeah. you, um, I think how you uh, sort of help her feel dignified while you're doing it by, continue talking to her and explaining what you're doing and I think it's just just you know it's just a really touching piece and then and then as you say you you, you fill it full of you know all the, all the social theory and all, all the reading that you've done you've got lots of books behind you behind you there yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah exactly so I mean I mean just 
there are a few questions appearing. I, I just wanted to ask just a very broad question. This might put you a bit on the spot, but I mean, are you are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of care homes and care work? Uh, I mean, I, I want. I know there's wonderful. Uh, magnanimous is that the right word I don't know it is wonderful carers who work uh, uh, operators within the care system um, uh, but I just I, I, I just don't, don't know I've obviously highlighted a few of the systemic failings and stuff like that I've got to say I even though I'm someone who I consider myself almost socialistic but definitely progressive so I'm not likely to vote for Tories but I it was heartening to see the the Tories actually put shift focus to the care homes, but I just don't think the 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 package that they've put forward that is contingent on you know the NHS going into hyperdrive and paying off uh, a, a lot of the COVID backlog before any of it trickles down to social care. I don't think that's going to be the thing that's going to have any impact because I, I doubt there will be any money left over. Um, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just quite, I'm just quite cynical about, I don't know, about privatization or privatization or semi-privatization and, you know, like market principles being applied to, to care work because it always seems to, you know, it works well in manufacturing and distribution or saying for, for saying there's an object, but human to human labor, um, but it, it, it it doesn't factor in the mess of being a human and so to do had to have a system that's very task oriented and time managed just it, it you, you cut it's like putting yeah you know like putting a square into a round peg or whatever it's, it, does, it doesn't work no i think that really comes across actually in what you say um and it, it is those sort of intangible kindnesses i think and particularly for people at the end of their lives who, who aren't able to do as much as they could do before or even understand what's going on and that really comes i mean i think uh you know i i i'd like to have someone like you as my carer when i when i eventually get to that point but uh, that comes through so there, there are there are a few questions uh, appearing so I'll, I'll just go through these in order i think we've got a little bit of time so um the first one's just about um saying how do you cope with the inevitability of the people you're caring for eventually dying and do you find yourself self prone to bouts of sadness or can you maintain some degree of emotional distance I think uh, it's yeah because because of the way it's again it's because of the the, uh, the financial imperative to do so. The moment someone dies, that room is filled almost instantly. You know, the moment their person dies, their body is taken. That room is obviously disinfected and cleaned first and stuff. But it's a, another person occupies that space, that recent, very recently vacated space, and so because you've got such high turnover like that, you're never given a chance to, to grieve, like, because it's not, I, I say in the book, like rights, you know, last rights, like even elephants, I think they've done studies where elephants, well, they, they assume it's, it's some kind of r r ritual or process of like, like death oriented process of, of uh, commemorating the, the, the recently fallen elephant, uh, so even elephants have that, whereas we're just, you know, we're not, we're not asked to like sit and mourn that person or talk about them or recollect some of the memory. They're just, they're out, another room's in, now you've got a new one. And it's so, it's, it's so unnatural, uh, that, that, that way of doing that. And it does have a distance in effect, you know, it, it, it you're not, you just never have room to probably grieve, but then it probably, it probably accumulates. That's the problem. So we, we once had a five minute, no, 10 minute session of a grief counsellor, which was obviously like a new initiative that the the management decided to do that they didn't even stick to. And like the, the carers, you could just tell, even just re relating back to their own personal histories and stuff like, were just so totally broken and like, and in a job that compounds that, that pre-existing sadness as well. And it's, and it, it, it never yeah, they, yeah it, 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 it does force you to be quite cynical in the end and become quite jaded which is a real shame yeah I mean a, a sort of related question from someone asking about um, 
how angry are you at the way in which care homes became such an epicenter for COVID? I mean, I suppose it kind of relates to a similar sort of um, theme, really, in some way. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, the thing I'm glad one when one of the people was working on the book, they said uh, a kind of uh, a thing they how they characterised the book. They said, you know, it's obviously got loads of humour and like tenderness and stuff, to it, but there is just a streak, a kind of uh, of anger. There is an there is parts of it that is can be quite an angry, rhetorically angry book, and not. I hope not in like too much. I don't want to. I, I I don't consider myself a very angry person at all, but I do feel anger at the way these care homes are run, and how you know a lot of just especially during COVID a lot of people on the ground let you know on the on the front line on the ground floor they they could see what was happening and the ones who had great great initiative and great common sense were putting the uh were, were putting things in place preventative measures in place like months before the the uh you know the government played catch up um and because and the reason is is because they just weren't listening they weren't listening to this uh this this collective resource that you have of like listening to the people who work in that system listen to the care managers listen to the carers and it can work both ways as well i said like it, it, a review that recently reviewed it was a wonderful review for the book but they said uh, about doctors having a god complex which isn't actually something i say in the book but i kind of i, I jokingly uh, allude to there's there's a certain superiority or a, uh, a kind of vaunted positioning of, of of certain medical practitioners and most you know the wonderful highly educated brilliant people and i would never denigrate for that but we found that rather than these two institutions, the hospital and the care home working together, they're always trying to pin the blame on each other. And they're never, um, they're never willing to kind of listen to carers who are deemed to be uneducated, um, you know, like just grunts work, like that they, they don't actually have uh, any knowledge of, of, of any medical knowledge or knowledge of their residents, even though we're the ones who spend the most time with these people. So yeah, that can that can be frustrating as well. I think that's really interesting, actually. Um, that there is, I, I, in the experience of the work I do, I think there is that there is an assumption that the health and social care system is all one big system that all works well together, but it is very siloed, as you say, and it, it it's quite hard to sort of, well, as you say, for people to talk across to each other and, and to, uh, to to for for care to be continuous in that way. Yeah. So, so a, a slightly less, um, see, well, I think, I don't know, it might be a very serious question, but, but more about your, uh, your, your entertainment um, discussion and you know, what you were telling us about um, you know, in your tour. Um, so someone said they're interested in how you choose the music and comedy to appeal to residents. Um, they said, personally, I can't imagine anything worse than a bunch of bagpipers rocking up to entertain me. So, <laughs> yeah, so, see, that, like, how, how do you go about that? Then? Let's see, that's, that is very, very true. right? And this is what we didn't want to, we didn't want to kind of just throw, like throw a load of, that's why we said we didn't want to like perform at the residence. We didn't just want to assume they're going to love this, this and this and just spun them in a corner and point the, you know, point them in the right direction or whatever. We, we wanted to, uh, make it interactive and make it sort of a, a, a re reciprocal so we're kind of like there's a reciprocity between what they're telling us and then what we're doing and then what we're doing and how they're responding to what we're doing and we would also we would just it would, as I said it'd just be like a kind of like a workshop where we just start a discussion and the ones who were quite passive and just willing to observe they would say like oh no we're fine sitting here and we would leave them alone so we respect that we'd respect they don't you know they're fine just observing or doing what they want to do but you'd always have you know enough of them will kind of make themselves known and want to be part of the show and be a bit cheeky and whatever they give you I mean it, it goes down to the version of um care person-centered care you're supposed to provide anyway in that you're supposed to stay consistent with that person's version of reality and tailor your care to their specific needs as a person. So we usually do a lot of like, like just informal fact finding, like we just get to know the residents, know what they're like and what they're interested in. And then 
it could be something something as simple as that. This one bloke said that he when he, he, he like he's a carpenter and his wife when his wife and his kids are doing his head in, he wanted to build a burger house big enough for his wife and kids to put in the garden when they were annoying him. So then we just us and the rest of the group started talking about, oh, who would who's annoying us? Who would we put in the birdhouse? And like we'd all say who is uh, putting us birdhouse. We all um, would as a group try and decide what's the best way to build this birdhouse. And then but and then another bloke uh, started talking about uh, what he, he started talking about saying else. I think he's one who actually challenged me to an arm wrestling match. And then, then we pivot to all that. OK, so this guy wants a an arm wrestling match so we'll do that and they, these can be the spectators and it just it's shifting it's really nebulous and it just um it changes from moment to moment depending on what the the residents are basically steering the the direction of travel for that for that particular game or interaction so yeah. No, that's that's great. So, so just one one final question before we we wrap up. Then, uh, but back back to sort of more more serious matters. I think, but you, you've mentioned this quite a lot in your book about wandering up and down trying to explain Brexit to everyone, as, as well as Trump and all the other yeah, yeah. all the other fun and games that we've had in the last ten years. So, um, someone's asked about: Have you seen the impact of Brexit affect the availability of care workers and? what else needs to be done to think more about sort of better pay and career conditions in social care? Yeah, that's a great, a great question because I'd have, I, I would have a lot of migrant workers who would, that, that I, and they knew I like, I'd read a newspaper and stuff, but they think I was this kind of font of wisdom to do with Brexit and that to really say, I'm really, I'm really not, but I'll do everything I can to help like help keep you informed and you know i'll go talk to other people and see what information i can find because there was so much fear about their status about about their their, their legal status in this country and um that as far as i can see that has subsided now not i'm sure there's still plenty of people who are really worried about it and stuff like that but just on an anecdotal personal level where there was a point in time where like every migrant worker I was working with was just really worried and trying to get information um, that that ha doesn't really happen now. But I, yeah, I, 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 I don't really, I, I wish I, I need to, this is a, a, a blind a blindness in this gap in my knowledge. Um, I don't really know. I, I don't really know how I'm sure there's probably loads of very obvious uh, repercussions within care work as a result of Brexit, but I don't know enough about how that like how it's structured to 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 be able to uh to be able to um yeah to talk about it from an informed position. But uh just back to the other part of the question, just in general, um professionalization and incentivization, so better pay, better uh be better better um education, better um uh, training for for carers um and just yeah kind of more funding and yeah like lots basically Ed, there's about 50 different things you could mention that I, as a lowly carer and i tried i tried to not resort to this but because I'm stumped at the answer, I am going to resort to this. As a lowly carer, I don't know anything. I don't know nothing about this. So <laughs> just, I would like more money for paid per hour. Luckily, I work, my sole source of income is as a stand-up comedian now, but I have gone back to care work during the pandemic. Um, and I still do 10 hours of care a week, just one-to-one -one care. And the, the, the all the problems that were still there, that were there, are still there. And have been exacerbated and um and uh, under severe critical staff shortages is usually the root to most of the problems so yeah I, anything I, to alleviate that i think that's all that's all very fair and i think it's yeah it's very hard to put it on you to say well how, how do you fix all this but yeah no i i think i i think you're probably quite right and there's an awful lot going on as you say we've got this well supposedly this money that's coming into social care mm -hmm. We've got you know effective Brexit, effective pandemic, so we we will see see where it takes us. But I, it's been, that's been absolutely fascinating, um, Pope. That's been really good, and thank you very much for spending the time to uh, to to talk about your book. Um, so 
the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the Watch Again section of the festival website after, 20, after the 24th of June, uh, which is the end of the festival. Um, and the people who've attended the, the, uh, the session today will be contacted by email um, and told when the video is available to view. So you and I will be preserved for, forever, I think, uh, Pope, in that sense. Um, and if you'd like to purchase a copy of Pope's book, which I would heartily recommend, um, it's called I'll Die After Bingo, A Decade as a Care Home Assistant. That will be available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books, um, other, other booksellers as well. But uh, so for more information on books, please see the festival website or head direct to foxlanebooks.co.uk forward slash festival ideas. And finally, we very much hope that you'll continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas. Um, continue to look at the website, yorkfestivalideas.com for full details of all the events in the, in the programme. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue the conversation using the hashtag, uh, uh, hashtag York Ideas. <laughs>